Welcome, everybody. Welcome to this session, the making of the Oracle R2DBC driver. And as a bonus presentation, how to turn your synchronous code into a reactive one. My name is Kwasi Mensa. I do product management for all the Java stuff for the Oracle database. And with me is Michael. Hello. Michael. Okay, next slide, please. Here's the agenda. We will tell you where we're coming from, you know, how we get here. And then Michael will dig into the making of the Oracle R2DBC driver because he wrote it. So you want to stick around. And then he will also give you a bonus presentation on how to turn your code, your synchronous JDBC code into reactive code using R2DBC. Next slide, please. So long time ago, in 2017, which is very long time now, uh, we started this project called Asynchronous Database Access API ADBA. And we were, we were very ambitious, you know, we wanted to have a new Java standard database access API. And the main characteristic is user thread never blocks. Okay, user threat never blocks. You make a call, you immediately get uh, the, the you, it returns and you can do some other stuff, right? And the, the other characteristic is no compatibility with JDBC. It, it's not interoperable, complementary, no, 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 no. Totally different API. And the motivation was to where to furnish better throughput. You know, we all know that synchronous calls, especially for database access, is uh, is a problem. You know, JDBC is a synchronous API, and that is a problem for scalability, for higher throughput on the same platform. So that was one of the motivation. The other motivation were the ability to issue multiple operations simultaneously without waiting for one before you do the other. In that perspective, we could do map reduce, for example, or we could access simultaneously multiple shards on a sharded database. And we could do operations such as fire and forget, uh, calling, making calls for start proc or things like that. So it, from my perspective, it's a, it was a beautiful API, well-designed, you know, all the bells and whistles, and you can see the API on the Open JDK site over here, right? So next slide, please. So the question you might ask is, why didn't we release ADBA? Why did we stop working on ADBA? So thank you for the question. Uh, there are two reasons. The first one is, uh, the Java SC team in Oracle, this is an organization who came through the Sun acquisition. They work with the Java community, the JCP and all the Java stakeholders to define standards, to define new APIs, etc. So from their perspective, the future of Java scalability is virtual threats, project loop. Okay, so would that same uh, organization approve a new API, which is an asynchronous solution to a problem that is being addressed by virtual thread? So the answer is no, I mean, they cannot approve this new API. So <laughs> we are doomed, okay? And the problem is for us is unless this becomes an a standard, we don't feel we will get much traction and it will not be worth the investment that we're making in terms of engineering, product management, all those things. So that was one of the main reasons. The second reason was that the community itself, the Java community itself, did not support us very warmly or very strongly. There were some, some people who were supporting us. We even had a conversation with the, the R2DBC organization, but R2DBC was already, you know, 
burgeoning and the people were, uh, you know, gravitating towards L2DBC. So for both reasons, we decided to stop uh, our work on R2DBC. Next slide, right. please. And so then what? Well, then we decided to focus on a JDBC reactive extension that I will present to you in the next slide. We decided to also start working on Oracle's own uh, R2DBC, I mean, for the Oracle database by following the, 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 the SPI. So we start working with the R2DBC uh, team and the very gracious team. We work very well with that team. And we also are instrumenting our drivers to support digital threat. So as we speak, you can use our drivers with the early access uh, virtual thread uh, you know, uh, distribution. Next slide, please. This is a snapshot of what the reactive extensions are. So those are built into the driver. So you get an Oracle JDBC driver, the, the OJDBC 11.jar, you know, we released JAR based on JDK. So the OJDBC 11 is the driver built with JDK 11. So if you get that one, you have the built-in extension, right? So in, in a nutshell, I'm not gonna go into the details of that. I think just, just know that the main cluster six is all calls return immediately, no call blocks. So you could get a connection using the build connection publisher and it will return a publisher. I need to say that this, extension is built on Java util concurrent flow. So it returns publisher or subscriber types, right? So you can see that, for example, SQL execution, we, we make a parallel with standard JDBC calls. So for example, execute, execute batch, execute query. Those are JDBC calls. So we came up with the equivalent, execute async Oracle, execute as, update async Oracle, etc. So async Oracle, because we don't want to clash with any future or probable uh, ext reactive extension by the Java, by the JDBC standard. So we don't know anything, but we're just being cautious. So that's why we added this barbaric extension async Oracle, but it does what it does, right? So. You, you can make a call and it returns immediately to consume result set. We have this publisher Oracle thing, which uh, takes a mapping function with a type and you apply that to every row. The ORA row are the, the row data coming from the, the data with the result set. And then we have APIs to, 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 to read or, or, or write to LOBS and same thing for clubs. And on the other side, we have the closing a connection asynchronously, committing transaction or rolling back transaction asynchronously. So that's in a nutshell, but I'm sure Michael will come back to that. Next slide, please. So with that, this is what you can do today, you know, using not, not just that, but with the reactive extension in blue and uh, be built on top of the standard JDBC API or on the side, you, you can say on the side or on top of it, right? So at the bottom of this slide, you can do, you can still do your synchronous JDBC calls, right? That's given. And then when you go up higher a little bit, using the green, the, the, the blue box in the driver, that's the reactive extension. And with that, you could make async calls non-blocking calls with back pressure support because we are based on Java util concurrent flow. And if you go a little bit higher, you could use any third party reactive streams library, you know, Reactor, Rx, Java, Akash streams, the Vertex, any, any, any of those which support the org reactive streams types. And we have an adapter class to map from org reactive streams types to uh, Java util uh, concurrent flow types. So with that, you could do a full reactive stream programming. 
but that's not why we are here today. So I'm going to now turn to Michael to tell you about the Auto DVC driver. Okay. So, so I'm the programmer um, who, if we go back, so we've just gone through this whole saga of you know, ADBA, reactive extensions, um, and R2DVC. So if we go back to late 2018, um, ADBA is kind of dead. And our customers and our users, they, they still want reactive, though. So we, we want to deliver something for them. And um, so we set out to make these reactive extensions. Um, my task as the programmer, it's uh, I, I'm tasked with um, take the synchronous JDBC API, turn it reactive, and it needs to have the exact same behavior. Um, so what I have up on the screen, on the left is kind of a mock-up of um, how you might implement prepared statement execute um, you, you, using a blocking database call, which we see kind of towards the end of the method. Um, and then on the right is kind of a naive approach to translating that synchronous code into asynchronous code. Non-blocking asynchronous, I want to be clear about that. Um, so you see that happening here. I make a non-blocking database call on my JDBC connection, and I say execute the sync this uh, SQL asynchronously. Also, going to note um, the flux type I'm using here. This is from a Reactive Streams library called Reactor. Uh, it's an excellent library. Uh, there's other libraries that are also very excellent too, like RxJava and there's many others out there. But for all these examples, I'm going to be using a flux type. A flux is a implementation of this, of a publisher. Um, and it allows me to work with it a bit like Java util stream, where uh, if I have a stream of values coming from this publisher, I can apply operators to that stream. So in this example, uh, I'm using a map operator. And I'm going to take a SQL result and then turn it into a Boolean value evaluated by uh, checking if the result sets null or not. So one thing we can notice um, when we look at the synchronous and asynchronous implementations here, there's a lot of common code. Um, and we can even break that code down kind of into three sections. So we have our blue section at the top, which is, this is totally identical side by side. Um, and this blue section is kind of doing all the things that the driver needs to do before it makes that database call. And then at the bottom, we have this green section. Again, it's identical between async and synchronous. And this block of code is going to execute all the statements it needs to uh, to kind of handle the result of this database call. And the only difference between these two implementations is this middle section where um, we're going to call into another method. And in the synchronous version, we call into a blocking method. It blocks, and then it returns the SQL result object. Whereas in the asynchronous method, we're going to call it down into another asynchronous method. And that completes asynchronously with this SQL result object. So here's why we introduced this lambda of saying, I need a call back. I can't sit here and block and wait for a result. I need that result to just be input to a callback. Um, so one problem we should all be noticing here is the duplicate the duplicated code is not good, right? Because someone's going to come, they're going to make a fix and execute, and then they're not going to realize, oh, wait, there's a duplication of this in execute async. And, you know, best case scenario that they do remember that, and now they're they're upset because they got to write the same code twice. Uh, worst case scenario, they don't even 
think, oh, I got to update this other method. And now this other method still has a bug in it. So it needs to be fixed. So what we ended up doing uh, when we developed the reactive extensions is we took a lot of code that looked like what I had on the left. I'll actually go back to it. We have these kind of big methods with these big blocks of code. And we were able to extract those uh, common code blocks out and just put them into separate methods. So the blue section becomes our prepare for execute method. And then the green section became our handle result method. Um, and, and this was actually a nice kind of side effect um, of, of going through and developing these extensions is we ended up with methods that were a little shorter. So if we look at the synchronous execute method now in the top left, it's pretty easy to read through it. And I mean, there's not much to read, but you can get a really high level sense of like, okay, here's what this method does. It does some kind of setup for the, for the call, makes that call, and then it handles the result. And that's great if I just want to maybe like step through execute with a debugger. And then if I really care about every little detail about preparing for executing the statement, I can go to prepare for execute. And, and I can see that there. Um, but the reason the objective of doing this is, is to have what we have in the top right with execute async Oracle. And now both methods are just calling the same common code. And the only difference between them is doing an asynchronous call and getting the result through a callback versus doing a synchronous call and getting the result as a return value. So this um, process kind of goes all the way down the stack, right? Because in the execute method, it's not like we're, we're going right up to the socket channel right now and we're we're making a blocking network IO call. We're, we're actually calling into another method, which is also synchronous. And there's a whole call stack like that um, that we go down. And eventually, if we look all the way on the right, eventually we get to uh, the network channel and we're actually gonna do a communication with the database. And in the blocking, uh, in the synchronous JDBC, in that call stack, it's uh, a socket write and then a blocking socket read. So we sit there and we wait for that response to come back for the database. And that's where your thread gets blocked. Now, in the reactive call stack, once we get to that network layer, we're going to use uh, something called a selector, which is capable of pulling thousands of socket channels all at once. And then once it sees that one of these sockets is ready for a read, it's going to go uh, basically invoke this chain of callbacks, which is those green handle result boxes. Um, and that's going to happen asynchronously. So, so the way the reactive call stack works is we go down this chain of like set up for this call invoke this method that's going to do a non-blocking call. And then that method is going to have its own setup. And then it's going to call another method. And then once the request is written to the network and on its way to the database, we return back that up that call stack and we return the publisher object. So that uh, when, when you call a reactive extension, it's, it's not going to block your thread. And you get that, the actual result of your database call through our kind of callback processing chain. OK, so that was the reactive extensions. And that's kind of our lowest layer of, of what we're talking about, because that's where we go all the way up to the socket. Um, and R2DBC, Oracle R2DBC, it's our implementation of R2DBC. There's implementations for other databases as well. Our implementation of R2DBC is, originally, it was thought to be a really trivial um, adapter over these reactive extensions. And then it kind of grew into more. And it was not as trivial as I originally thought, um, which is why, if, if you look at the link at the bottom, it's all open source. You can see this code base is it's not huge, but it, it's definitely bigger than I thought it would be. Um, but still, what I can say about that code base is 
it is essentially just a, an adapter for all the reactive extensions that we added to Oracle JDBC. It's adapting those um, extended proprietary methods into the service provider in interface, that's the SPI, into the service provider interface of R2DBC so that you can now get a standard API for asynchronous database access. It's not part of the JDK. We tried that, that was ADBA, it didn't work. But we have R2DBC and um, so we can, we can create a standard outside of the JDK as well. And that's, that's really what motivated us to do this project. So um, on this screen, I'm just kind of showing the mappings um, between uh, the reactive extensions and RTDBC. Uh, the first one is creating a connection. We use a connection builder in JDBC and then an RTDBC that becomes a connection factory. Uh, statements, um, pretty similar between the two. Just you call execute it asynchronously, um, gives you a result. Um, with our extension to the Oracle result set, we said, um, I'll give you a publisher of rows, but you have to provide this function. You have to provide this function that tells me, here's how I want to map that row data, which is really important for a driver because when you're getting this big stream of rows from the database, um, you're going to put that into some kind of buffer. And then you want to immediately free up that buffer as soon as you can, because it's going to take up a ton of memory. So this is why we require a function to create this, this row publisher, because the function says, OK, here's, here's what you're going to, you tell me what you want to do with this big buffer of data. You're going to map it to some kind of object. And then as soon as your function returns, Whew, okay, I can I can release this buffer and I can go get some more rows maybe and fill up that buffer more. Um, we we have very similar um, APIs between the reactive extensions and RTDBC to do that. So there's a result versus result set. In both cases, we're mapping uh, that that row data into a Java object. Uh, the next APIs uh, commit rollback close. These were pretty straightforward mappings uh, between reactive extensions and RTDBC. And also for blob and clob, um, if you want to read data from that uh, lob object asynchronously, uh, you can create a publisher to do that. RTDBC has a stream method. We have our publisher oracle method. OK, so now we've gone from the reactive extensions layer. We've gone up to the R2DBC layer. And now the next layer is your code. Because um, if you want to make use of all this, your code also needs to be written in a reactive style, or at the very least, a non-blocking asynchronous form, because um, there's other stuff out there that you can use, like completion stage. Um, so these uh, next examples I'm going to show are basically on the left side, we're going to see here's, here's how I accomplish some kind of interaction with the database using synchronous JDBC. And then on the right side, I'm going to show here's how you accomplish that exact same database interaction using asynchronous uh, reactive code with RTDBC. So the first thing we're going to do um, is you have to tell your driver, how do I connect to this database? So we provide things like the, the network host and the port. Also, for Oracle, we have a service name, and then other vendors have some, some kind of naming, some, some way to name a database. And then, of course, you have to provide a user password to authenticate. So JDBC, we use a data source object, and we call a bunch of setter methods, and we provide all these values. And now that data source can create connections to this database. With RTDBC, the equivalent to a data source is a connection factory. And instead of calling a bunch of setter methods, we get 
kind of a nicer um, a nicer way to do it, which is uh, a connection factory options object, and it has a builder. So now we can just chain a bunch of calls together, and in each call we can provide the the value we're configuring or the option. So like driver, host, port, database, and then the actual um, value we want to configure for that option. OK, so now we have a connection. Now we want to go run a SQL query. Um, on the left for JDBC, we create a statement with our connection. And we tell that statement, go execute this query. Uh, for sake of example, I'm just executing a query that returns a hello JDBC greeting. And that gives us a result set object. And then with a the result set, we can kind of iterate through the rows. And at each row, we can map each column value to a Java uh, type. So we say result set next to get to the first row. And then we, we tell the result set on this row, map the first column at the one based index to a string. And then we have a case here, if there are no rows, which really shouldn't happen with this code, but if it does, we'll throw uh, an exception out. So on the right side is the equivalent with RTDBC. Now we're going to do this uh, really similar select query, uh, except this time we're saying hello, RTDBC. Um, and when we call execute on that statement, it's not going to block and return a result set. It's going to. Uh, immediately return a publisher that will emit a result object. So what we want to do is use a flat map operator. Again, we're using Project Reactor's flux type here. Um, all reactive libraries have some kind of flat mapping operator. And what we tell this flat mapping operator is, given this input of a result object, I want you to turn that into another publisher. I want you to re uh, turn that result into uh, the publisher returned by calling result map. So here, um, to the call to result map, we're providing this row mapping function that I kind of covered briefly before. And we're in that function, we're saying every row, I want to transform the column at index 0, because we're going to use 0 based indexes for RTDBC, unlike JDBC, which uses 1 based. Um, we're saying, at each row, I want to get the column uh, at index 0, and I want to get it as type string. So this is equivalent, actually, to calling get string on a JDBC result set. Let's um, stop, because it's, it's really good to understand what flat map does, because this is going to be used throughout all the other examples. So I put this little mathematical almost notation in the bottom right, where um, we say, uh, if you can give me a function that takes one value x as input, and for that input, it outputs a stream of y values. Um, you can provide that function to a flat map operator. And now every value coming out of this publisher is going to be mapped into your stream of Y values. And then what I'm going to do, so, so at the second line, we can kind of see, um, here's a stream of X values. I'm going to map each one of those into its own stream. And then the result is going to be kind of this flattening of each of those Y streams into one long stream. So if, if uh, F of X0 outputs Y00 and Y01 up to Y0N, and then F of X of 1 outputs Y10 and Y11, all those um, individual streams are going to almost be concatenated together um, or flattened into one stream. So, so what we're doing, if we look at the code example again, uh, is saying for each result, in this case, there's going to be just one result. 
So it's a little simpler, but we're saying given this one X value or this one result, turn that into a stream of strings. Uh, the string is gonna be our kind of Y value in this case. Um, for, for each row, we, we get one string out. And then, oh, also we'll talk uh, about the switch if empty operator. Um, this is equivalent to that else case with JDBC where we're going to say if um, if this stream completes empty, then uh, complete with an error. OK, so this is, uh, we just did a query. This is uh, showing an insert. With uh, JDBC, we mark parameters with this question mark symbol that appears in the insert string. And we can bind values to those parameters by calling setter methods on the proposed statement. So we, we're here we're inserting an ID and a value into this table. And for the ID at index one, we bind the value zero. And for the value at index two, we bind the value JDBC. RTDBC on the right, uh, it's pretty similar. We're using uh, question mark parameter markers again. You can also use name parameter markers um, if you prefer. But here we're just sticking with the index to make it uh, as close to JDBC as we can. Uh, and then again, uh, we're using zero based indexes with RTDBC. So at index zero for the ID, we bind the value zero. And at index one for the value, we bind the value RTDBC. We execute this statement. Uh, and this time, we're going to flat map the result into an into a count of the rows that have been updated by this insert. So we call get rows updated. And that uh, that returns a publisher of an integer. So we can see that in the return type to insert RTDBC is uh, we created a publisher of a result by calling statement execute. And then we flat map that result into the update count. And so that kind of transformed our publisher into an integer publisher. Next example is an update uh, very similar to the insert. We're going to bind some values, and we're going to execute. And then we're going to, in JDBC, return an update count, and in RTDBC, flat map into an update count. OK, so those are the basic examples. Um, the next examples, I'm going to try to show some of the more complicated cases that I actually kind of ran into while I was doing that translation of um, for the reactive extensions. I had to translate synchronous into reactive. Um, and the most challenging cases were kind of control flow statements um, like if else, which is going to be this first example we see, and, and how to translate that into an asynchronous implementation. Um, so, so what this method is going to do is say, I want to um, I want to update a row in the database, and if that row doesn't exist, then I should insert it. So, in, in the JDBC code on the left, we call that update JDBC method that we looked at earlier, which is going to update a row, and we look at the count of rows updated. Well, if it's zero, that means the row doesn't exist. So now I'm going to go run that blocking insert, and I'm going to go, go, go return that update count. And then in our else branch, we say, OK, well, if it's not zero, great, we did it, and we can just return our update count. So for R2DBC on the right, uh, we're doing the equivalent, um, except now we're creating a chain of operators on a publisher. So I want to just point out, um, what we're going to do, what our publisher is going to do, is going to depend on the result of that update. And we don't know that update when we call update R2DBC, because that update is coming to us through a callback. So one thing you might think to do is say, OK, well, I'll call update 
with R2DBC, and I'll get this publisher of an update count, and, and now I'll just kind of block, and I'll just wait for that update count to arrive, and then I'll do like what JDBC does, and I'll, and I'll go into this, to this if else with the update count, and then and then maybe I'll do an insert with R2DBC. Should never ever do something like that. Um, because what you're doing when you block for that we update count, to, we have to wrap up, Micah. We're out of time. Yeah, unfortunately, okay. I I thought we had forty five, but no, it was thirty. Oops. Okay. Um, can we like make that. this? Oh, this code. If you guys want to go uh, check out the rest of the examples, you can go to GitHub, Oracle forward slash Oracle RTDBC. And if you look in the examples folder, I actually put all of these code examples up there. And there's a ton of Java docs, because I love Java docs. And so hopefully, um, you can learn uh, the rest of the examples that we didn't have time for. Sorry about that. I didn't. Um... Yeah, we, we messed up in terms of planning. We thought it was 45. <laughs> yeah, but the code is there. And honestly, like me personally, I like to just dig through the code on my own anyway. I learn it better that way than someone speaking it to me. Um, so if you go on GitHub and you can see all these examples, and then this this is the best one too. It's a loop. Okay. So, so. show the last last slide. Yeah, that one. Yeah. <laughs> now they have yeah. after DBC and third party, and you can do all sort of reactive database access. Well, I think we're done. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Bye.